Our next speaker will be talking about the impact of Maxwell's demon on information theory and computing. If we hear any doors slamming open and shut, we'll know it's the demon. And I, have, I have the distinct honor of introducing uh, Professor Jim uh, Khalili, um, a professor of physics at University of Surrey, and uh, uh, is a world famous, I'm sure many people in here know him, physicist, author, and broadcaster. Professor Khalili. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, before lunch, Malcolm Longair mentioned briefly uh, something about Maxwell's demon. Uh, I want to explore it a bit further. In fact, I want to resurrect Maxwell's demon. I want to bring him back to life, at least temporarily, and explore the legacy that that particular paradox, that thought experiment has had on, on many areas of physics, particularly the link between the physical world and the notion of information. Now, if you ask uh, a physicist uh, what is the most profound or important concept in physics, some might say it's conservation laws or the notion of symmetry. Maybe the universe began with the Big Bang, or maybe, as Richard Feynman said, that everything is made of atoms. But I suspect many would say that it is the second law of thermodynamics. Um, the second law essentially is, a, is a, the idea that entropy, the amount of disorder in a system, increases. It never decreases. By entropy and, and disorder, I mean the fact that clocks unwind, things decay, balls roll down hills, we grow older. Things don't happen in reverse. You put a sugar lump into a cup of coffee and stir it, the sugar lump will dissolve. You don't res uh, reconstitute that sugar lump with further uh, stirring. In fact, a, a famous quote by Albert Einstein, it's, it's the only physical theory of universal content which I am convinced will never be overthrown. The only one will never be overthrown. So everything else basically is up for grabs, but not the second law of thermodynamics. Well, Maxwell, in a lecture and then in a, in a paper in 1967, dev devised this thought experiment. Uh, it, he was, what he was trying to do was show the statistical nature of, of thermodynamics. And again, we heard from, from, from Malcolm earlier uh, his work that preceded uh, people like uh, Ludwig Boltzmann's work on, on, on uh, statistical mechanics. Uh, Maxwell's idea was to try and show that the second law of thermodynamics was only correct statistically. It's not always correct. That you can, if you wait long enough, if the universe can, can stay around for long enough, by constantly stirring a cup of coffee, you could possibly, with a non-zero probability, eventually reconstitute that sugar lump. And he devised this, this notion, this hypothetical demon who could break the second law of thermodynamics. Well, I want to, in my presentation, um, simply because I have these clips from TV programs, and, and it's lazy, uh, I've sort of chopped a bit, so I'm just showing you some clips. Since I talked about Maxwell's demon in a, in a, in a recent uh, program, I might as well show you that, and then I can, because I thought about what I was going to say carefully there, uh, it's much easier. So le let me just, first of all, introduce the problem. The science of thermodynamics had shown very clearly that over time, the entropy of the universe, its disorder, would always increase. Things were destined to fall apart. But the demon seemed to suggest that you could put things back together without using any energy at all. Just by using information, you could create order. It would prove to be a fiendishly difficult problem to solve. See what I did there, fiendishly. I'd love to say this was all PowerPoint animation, but uh, it's not. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, uh, and here's another clip where I, I describe, essentially, the, 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 the paradox that, that uh, Maxwell uh, laid out. <laughs> Okay. 
Maxwell theorised that simply by knowing what's going on inside a box full of air, it would be possible to make one half hotter and the other half colder. Think of it like building an oven next to a fridge without using any energy. It sounds crazy, but Maxwell's argument was extremely persuasive. It goes like this. Imagine a small demon perched on top of the box who has such excellent eyesight that he can observe accurately the motion of all the molecules of air inside the box. Now, crucially, he's in control of a partition that divides the box into two halves. Every time he sees a fast-moving molecule approaching the partition from the right-hand side, he opens it up, allowing it through to the left. And every time he sees a slow-moving molecule approaching the partition from the left, he opens it up, allowing the molecule through to the right. Now, you can see what's going to happen. Over time, all the fast-moving, hot molecules will accumulate on the left-hand side of the box and all the slow-moving, cold molecules on the right. Crucially, the demon has done this sorting with nothing more than information about the motion of the molecules. Maxwell's demon seemed to say that just by having information about the molecules, you could create order from disorder. Order. I cut it too soon. Um, so essentially what Maxwell's demon does is reduce the entropy uh, in, in the box. Now, I'd like to be able to say that this, is, this can be simply explained if you think of, rather than a demon with some sentient intelligence, we replace it with a mechanical valve or a trap door because, of course, what, we, what we're talking about here is, is uh, dividing the, the box up into two halves with different temperatures. You could do the same thing with two sides having different pressures. Uh, uh, and, of course, then it's more clear to see how that you could then use that low entropy state to do useful work. This, this, this had great relevance to those who, were, who still dreamed of, of, of uh, inventing perpetual motion machines, for example. So, you know, it's, it's violating the second law. Well, it, it's uh, actually, if you do look very simply uh, at how you could make a pressure differential with a trap door that only opens one day, you very quickly come a cropper and realize that doesn't explain the situation. In fact, there's a, a, a long history of people thinking very carefully about this and trying to resolve it. Uh, and that's what I want to, to, to cover in the next few minutes. Is my third short clip. It's not all full clips, though, I promise. It's amazing the, the impact he had had on, on physics and that he came up with this very intricate concept and that he already, in some sense, pre, well, anticipated the, the notion of information that wasn't actually there at that time. There was no such thing. I think this idea was, was astonishing. He didn't really have a resolution. He raised it as a, as a concern and he left it open. And I think what followed is more or less 120 years of, of extremely exciting debates and developments to try to resolve and address this uh, concern. Well, it, was, it became clear that really to resolve this issue properly, it had to be done carefully. Uh, mathematically, certainly with, uh, with the work of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. I put him down there as the father of statistical mechanics. Maybe I should replace him with Maxwell as the true father of statistical mechanics. Um, and Boltzmann, so he encapsulated as the famous uh, Boltzmann principle, Boltzmann equation, which mathematizes this rather vague and nebulous notion of entropy, that the entropy S can be defined as a, a constant, Boltzmann's constant K, multiplied by the log 
of this quantity w, which, which really essentially is the size of phase space. It's the number of degrees of freedom. The more complicated uh, a system can be uh, uh, in distinguishable different states, the larger w is, and hence the larger s is. Um, a simple way of describing this uh, maybe is to think about uh, a pack of cards that you begin with all ordered into their suits in ascending or descending order uh, and the suits separated. We think of this, as a, this ordered pack as having low entropy. By shuffling the cards, we increase the entropy. We arrive at a mixed pack with uh, higher entropy. This is a highly disordered state. Now, it would then... The, the notion, which was, uh, would not arrive until well into the 20th century, uh, was that this state contains much more information uh, than that. And I'll explain why in a moment. But physicists eventually realized that you couldn't banish the demon simply by replacing it with a mechanistical device that could separate things. Because that, that just wouldn't work. You can't violate the second law just with a valve or a trap door. The second law remains, remains safe. However, it did seem as though this demon by gaining information, somehow that there was a link between that knowledge that it learnt uh, and the lowering of entropy in the box. And that's what people needed to understand. Now, Leo Zillard was probably the next character uh, who, who, uh, who played a role in this, in this story. Uh, Zillard was quite remarkable and, and, and unsung. I guess for many people, if you know something about the history of physics, Zillard, I mean, he, I think he worked with Fermi in the 1930s, but he certainly famously was the person who wrote the letter that Einstein signed that, uh, that led to the Manhattan Project and, 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 and convincing uh, America to, to, to build the bomb. But Zillard was, a, was an incredible physicist and inventor. He invented not only the linear accelerator, the electron microscope, and the cyclotron, <laughs> but he never patented any of them. Other people won Nobel Prizes for, 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 for these inventions, but he got there first before anyone else. Um, there, there was this period in Zillard's life in the late 20s, early 30s, when he was incredibly productive, incredibly uh, wide-ranging in, 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 in coming up with, with new ideas. And it was in the late 20s, in 1929, when he published a key paper on the reduction of entropy in a thermodynamic system by the interference of an intelligent being. Some, it was it's sort of almost as, the, it was as though... It, it was moving away from what physicists would like to do, which is explain things just in terms of laws of physics and mechanistical uh, explanations and bringing in some sort of you know, sentience. It was almost sort of pseudo-scientific for many people that somehow the intelligence of this being is required to, 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 uh, to save the second law of thermodynamics. But as what Zillard was doing was making the first clear connection between thermodynamics and the notion of information. And it was really, I guess, thanks to Zillard, that the whole area of information theory and modern computing can be referred back to. He talked about Maxwell's demon in terms of reducing the entropy of the air, the air molecules in the box, by increasing the entropy in the demon's brain. That by the act of acquiring information, the demon would increase entropy in its brain, and that would balance out the reduction of entropy uh, in the box. Uh, he thought of, you know, if, we don't even have to think about it in modern day uh, in terms of some hypothetical demon that's intelligent. You can think of it as a computer that, uh, that can uh, store information in its memory banks. So imagine before the demon knows anything about where all the particles in the box are, its brain is a, is a blank slate. There's, there's no information content there. If we think about it in terms of sort of binary zeros and ones, it's just a whole load of zeros. There's no information content there. That's, that is a low entropy state. You can't get much order than all, lots of zeros. Okay? Uh, once it gains information, it knows where every molecule in the box is and how fast it's moving, then that information is stored in its banks. It had now has in its brain high, uh, a high entropy state. And that balances out the low entropy state in the box. It would seem as though 
that nicely resolves the problem. Um, many argued that the, the demon expends energy just by opening, and this is the, the, the early simple idea, expends energy just by opening and closing the partition. But of course you can quickly realize that that shouldn't matter at all. Imagine that partition could be opening and closing at random times, operated by some external um, energy that doesn't, isn't part of the demon box system. Uh, all the demon has to do is decide when it should open and close. If the demon was just opening and closing the, the, that partition randomly, it would be expending the same amount of energy, but if it was doing it randomly, there would be no um, distribution of, of, of the two sides of the box into sort of hot and cold, high pressure, low pressure. So we'd be expending energy for nothing. So clearly, energy expended in opening and closing the partition is not the problem. What many people then were, became more and more convinced of after Zillard's work was that it was the act of measurement itself that required some minimum expenditure of energy, some dissipation of heat into the system. So by lowering the air, by looking to see where each molecule is, you have to measure it. By that act of measurement, that, that costs entropy. It costs some, some, some energy. Uh, and so that, that, was the, that was sort of, it made people feel more comfortable that you're linking back the lowering of the entropy of the box to real dissipation of heat. Uh, uh, so you're back to thermodynamics and you don't have to worry about the memory breaks of, of, the, of the, the demon. But even that was then questioned in the 1960s. Zillard's principle suggested there was a minimum amount of entropy uh, increase required that was based on uh, Boltzmann's principle. Rolf Landauer in the early 1960s said, no, actually, you don't need to expend any energy, you don't need any entropy cost measuring the state of, of, the, of the system or for the demon to gain information. The entropy cost instead comes from having to erase that information from the demon's brain. So that led to what then became known as Landauer's principle, particularly uh, uh, the work of people like Charles Bennett. Uh, and it can be defined in this way, any logically irreversible manipulation, and, and, and so erasing memory, erasing information from a computer is logically irreversible because you can't retrieve that special, uh, that, that information uh, again afterwards. Um, that has to be accompanied by a corresponding increase in entropy through the dissipation of heat uh, into the uh, environment. There were a lot of papers, and that continues to this day, in fact, arguing about whether Landau was correct or whether uh, Zillard was correct. Where is that expenditure of entropy? Is it in the gaining of the information, or is it the, the fact that at some point the demon's brain is going to be so full of information you're going to have to wipe it to make room for more? Uh, but what if the demon has a very large memory and, and doesn't need to wipe it for a very long time? Um, one notion that then, uh, that in, in information theory, that became uh, made matters a bit clearer was, was the idea of algorithmic randomness. It was realized that they needed a, a more clear definition of what entropy was. The entropy, was you can't just say measure of disorder, but rather uh, it was a, a somehow a, a measure of how much information you need to encode the state of a particular system. Imagine we have five cards all arranged in ascending order. Five hearts, two, three, four, five, six. And here's another arrangement, two, five, four, three, six. Now, you could very well argue that that is no more special than that. We know that they, they are in ascending order, but that's a, you know, the chances of, of having a, 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 these five cards and shuffling them, the chances of obtaining them in this order is exactly the same of chances of finding them in this particular order. And yet, we talk about that state as having lower entropy than that state. And that's because, you see, the state of the cards on the left requires less information to encode to describe it. 
All you need to say is, arrange if you're writing a computer code, arrange cards in ascending order. That's all you need to do. But for this one, you would have to spell it out. Two first, then the five, uh, two first, then, then descending order, and then when you get to the sixth, you know, uh, put the tag that on the end, but you start the ascending order from five. So you, know, you have to put in a bit more information content. And this idea of algorithmic randomness became very useful in information theory to describe uh, uh, the, the, the entropy of, of, of a system. Maxwell's demon, whether or not it's been exercised, I think most physicists work, certainly those working in information theory, whether classical information theory or quantum information theory, would probably subscribe to Rolf Landauer's notion that it's actually the erasure of information that is important. But it's by no means universally agreed. Okay, so many would argue it is still an open question. In fact, many argue that you require, people like um, Zurich would argue that, in fact, you need quantum theory to finally describe it and explain it. And that's not just because, you know, when you get down to the measurement of individual molecules, the whole notion of the, the problem of measurement uh, in quantum mechanics is an issue, that you disturb the quantum state by the act of l learning about it. Uh, that's part of the problem. But uh, I, in, in reading up papers uh, on, on this subject, you realize people go into sort of, go to great lengths in, 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 in quite advanced in quantum information theory in order to try and resolve uh, the, the paradox of, of, of the demon. Um, in fact, I, I, uh, I was just recently reading a paper on this subject and, and I came across um, Gibbs paradox, which I hadn't actually heard of before. Now, Gibbs paradox involves the, uh, uh, rather having the box with just air molecules, you have the two partitions, each one with a different type of gas. Uh, and, and, and then and you have the partition. And then when you remove the partition, they, they permeate uh, and the whole overall the system increases in entropy but then what if you only have, have the two partitions with the same uh, uh, type of gas and you remove the partition it's already in equilibrium so there's no increase in entropy and and turns out apparently to resolve Gibbs paradox you need quantum mechanics according to some so I stopped digging into it at that point <laughs> I thought it's it's nice to know that there's there are still people worrying about something uh, after, after so long so I'd say that that was uh, another lecture uh, but I just wanted to, to end and say, well, what about Maxwell himself? The important thing is that, you know, we must remember, he had no interest in exercising the demon. He was, he was on the side of the demon. He was using the demon to highlight the statistical nature <coughs> of thermodynamics. Uh, so I guess he would be quite pleased to see that people are still running rings around themselves and trying to resolve this problem. Do we need quantum mechanics? Uh, it, wh where does the entropy increase come? Is it in the measurement of the positions? Is it in erasing the information from the demon's brain? It's, it's a fascinating um, problem in physics because usually these, these paradoxes, when they're first devised, they're called paradoxes. But very soon we learn more about that, that particular area of science and we resolve the paradox. They're still known as paradoxes, but they are resolved. It's, it's still an open question whether Maxwell's demon, the paradox of Maxwell's demon, has completely uh, been resolved. I just wanted to end, because this is, I'm, I'm really pleased with this. So, the nothing to do with Maxwell's demon. I made a program about Maxwell, well, it's not just Maxwell, but about electromagnetism uh, for BBC Four a couple of years ago. And so this was filmed in Glen Lair, uh, Maxwell's uh, um, country home, uh, in one of the rooms that, that on the demolished side of the house with no roof. Uh, and we set up a blackboard. My, I was so pleased my director allowed me to do this. Set up a blackboard, and then I, do, I started from Maxwell's equations and did what every undergraduate physics student has to learn to do. You derive the wave equation from Maxwell's equations, and you get down to the wave equation, and there's your constant of, of, of the wave equation uh, involving the permeability and permittivity of free space that is the speed of light. And that was Maxwell's great revelation, that you start with, with something that involves electric and magnetic fields, and you arrive with the speed of light, and therefore realizing that light itself is an electromagnetic wave. So uh, I still get excited by things like Maxwell's equations. I get a headache thinking about Maxwell's demon. Thank you very much. <laughs>
unpreserved un, uh, uh, side of uh, Maxwell's house, Glen Lair, has uh, recently been restored. So uh, that uh, was part was built by uh, Maxwell's father, and uh, uh, and of course before that we restored uh, the part of uh, Glen Lair that was re that was built by Maxwell himself. Any questions for Jim? Yes. Yep. Right there. Uh, your slide with the five cards, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. uh, prompted me to wonder if you could relate um, the idea of entropy to ideas in cryptography where you need information to extract the prime factors of a very large number. There are, when I said that uh, those who are looking at in, in working in quantum information theory, people like Vladko Vedral at Oxford, um, uh, that, that is more than simply the notion of you know, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. That's exactly what they're looking at. You, you look at papers with, with titles that involve things like Maxwell's Demon, and you, and you, you leave through them, and you, you come to sections with titles like quantum cryptography, entanglement, uh, and, and so on. And, and it, it's, it's a, certainly a huge field, and certainly people working in quantum information theory are still trying to clarify that link between the notion of thermodynamic entropy, information, Shannon entropy, and how it links with, with, uh, with quantum states. But, but I, I, I don't know any more than that to be able to say something more specific about uh, cryptography. Other questions? Uh, second row here. Excellent talk. Thank you for that. Yeah. I want to sort of come back to something I've mentioned earlier, which was non-equilibrium thermodynamics as essentially an area which is still active and open. And to just highlight maybe one or two issues there. So Jarzinski has an interesting piece of work that relates to non-equilibrium work. And there's a feeling I have looking at what you've described here, that in some way formulating these questions with a time component, i.e. with a non-equilibrium aspect, is part of the issue. So in some sense, developing truly non-equilibrium thermodynamic notions is at the heart of trying to understand these dilemmas? Yes, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think yes. <laughs> uh, more questions? Sir Michael. Simple question. What do you make of life? Uh, and the evolution of life is obviously going in the opposite direction. It creates order, not disorder. So the whole of biology is, of course, in the opposite direction. Now, you can argue that biology is a fairly recent phenomenon. Mm. The universe is a minor irregularity. But the hu human intelligence can imagine itself back any time in the past. So if you allow yourself to be a human being, it, abstractly, intelligence could be imagined in the Imaginary intelligence is as good as real intelligence. So maybe that's the solution of your problem. I well, it, you see that my uh, the, the danger I always have uh, think about when 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 considering issues like that is to then move to you know sort of the Penrose hammer of ideas of consciousness and quantum mechanics, for example. That somehow consciousness is mysterious enough that it's it's it's, it's almost a sort of vitalist picture that it's, it's something aside from. Uh, from the, the the physical universe, I th but I think, but you're right about life itself. Is is that is still an issue that I think you know? I, I still argue with biochemists about this. That you know, yes, all you need is that first replicator uh, that can make copies of itself, and then you allow Darwinian evolution to go, and ult ultimately the complexity builds up, and you get intelligence and consciousness. I think there's nothing more magic about consciousness, but it's that first step, that that from inanimate matter to to animate matter that. To get a system that can maintain a low entropy state, distinguishing us from steam engines, for example, I think is still a mystery. Time for one more question. I just want to, <clears throat> I just want to jump in in defense of Landau, because about three years ago, people did actually measure the erosure cost when you reset in, in within. Okay, it was a. Uh, a fairly simple system, but they could measure the reset energy, so that if you look at the way that you 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 erase the energy, uh, erase the information rather, you know, people could actually measure that thing. So about three years ago, in Kaiserslautern, people actually did that experiment. So you know, I come to the defence of Landau. 
I, I think there's probably, yes, I think there's, there's, there's no doubt that that is probably correct. There's a minimum amount of entropy increase, kt log n or whatever, you know, the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, the issue is whether that then discounts Zillard's principle. Uh, you know, it may be a combination of both, because you can imagine the demon or the computer that gains information, it can gain all that information uh, and use it to drop the entropy of the state, but then not delete it. Keep it in its memory banks, uh, and, uh, and indefinitely. You know, it, 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 it seems as though you, it, with, with Landauer, you, you only complete the cycle by, by erasing that information. But what if you don't complete the cycle? You, you know, you seem to, you can indefinitely maintain this breaking of, of, of second law. So it might, it might turn out to be a combination of both. I mean, I agree with that. I'm also, if you, if you ever do a, a reformatting of your laptop, it gets really hot. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, yeah, there, exactly. <laughs> That, that's it. Yes, quite. Yeah, I, 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 in fact, I, there, there was some discussion that then d d developed on Twitter a year or, or, or so ago about whether your, 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 your iPhone or your iPad is heavier or lighter when it's full of music. <laughs> and at that point, I gave up because I could be persuaded both ways. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank One you. more time. Thank you. Thank you.